On the border of two regions, Akmola and Karaganda, the different types of landscapes snarled together in a fancy pattern. The islands of mountain oasis rise amidst the boundless steppe. The northern slopes of mountains are covered with forest outliers. Rivers are trimmed with small elder groves. Yet once we go a little further to the north, to Yerimintau district of Akmola region, we'll find ourselves in the middle of a pinery. It's a big holiday today in the town of Yerimintau, as Buiratau National Park is hosting the March for Parks. School students, teachers, environmentalists and officials all gathered for this celebration. Marches for parks are held around the world with millions of people taking part in them. The tradition originates from the 70s of the last century when Harvard University students and popular rock musicians held a loud show called the Earth Day. They managed to draw the attention of politicians, media and the public to environmental issues. That was the time of green revolution in mass consciousness. Scientists, businessmen and politicians realized that nature conservation without public support by administrative methods only would not work and that environmental upbringing of citizens should start from the early childhood when we form our world outlook. National parks have three main missions. The first one is rational ecosystem management using protection and biotechnical measures. The second one is ecological education and awareness raising with a key role of ecotourism. And the third one is scientific research. In order to manage something successfully, one needs to know about it as much as possible. Therefore, every national park has a science unit. Today, the girls from Buiratau National Park and I will go on an educational tour. Lilia Konisova, an experienced guide, will lead the group. We will try to see some morales. Will you go with us? Of course I will. From the environmental point of view, all species, big and small, gorgeous and not really, are equally valuable for an ecosystem. But there are the so-called landmark or flagship species. Tourists love them, they make TV programs about them, they are in the spotlight of public attention. As a rule, these are large mammals or endemic birds. There is even a special term, attractiveness, that is the degree of appeal. No doubt, large cats are the champions of attractiveness. Yet the possibility of observing a morale during an eco-tour also attracts tourist attention. In daytime, morales hide in the thickets and come out to open meadows only in the morning and in the evening. It's hard getting close to them. Quiet. The most important thing is not to scare them away. Careful girls. It's a little swampy here. The Yerimintau mountain massive looks like an archipelago of small islands amidst the steppe ocean. Such low granite and basalt relics is all that had remained of the enormous Timano Altai Mountains rising here about 20 million years ago. The steppe hills are partially covered with woods. During the Virgin Lands campaign, the steppe areas adjacent to the Yerimintown Mountains were left unplowed. 
and that allowed preserving the local nature communities almost untouched. In the 70s of the last century, Bela Dimov and Yeremintau State Wildlife Reserves were established here. In 2002, they created their regionally governed Buiratau National Park. In 2011, two more wildlife reserves were included in its area. Girls, let's have a little rest. You are traveling light and I am tired carrying my camera. An experienced guide should not only demonstrate the best nature sites to tourists, but also give them as much information as possible about local culture, traditions and history. There's also the so-called Kolchak Road here. At least local old-timers say so. There was supposed to be a railroad built here. Preparing for the expedition, we surfed the internet and found out that the founder of the Anglo-Siberian company, a Scottish businessman, John Leslie Urquhart, indeed received Kolchak's permission to build that railroad. It is known for a fact that exactly 100 years ago, in the summer of 1919, the construction of the railway from Semipalatinsk to Semirechye did start. Yet it is unknown whether Urquhart the then owner of Karaganda coal mines, interested in expanding his trade network, managed to launch the railway construction works on the territory of the present-day Karaganda region. In fact, later we were able to find the remains of the road that Lilia told us about. But by the appearance of earth embankments, it was hard to say what was going on here in 1919. Could they have been used as military trenches? In any case, Mr. Urquhart was a real maverick if he risked starting such an ambitious project in the heat of the Civil War. From the ecological point of view, nature needs all species it has, be it big or small, beautiful or not really. Yet the opportunity to see morales will make a tour merely unforgettable. Yeah. Girls, it's the morales. Did you hear them? Some scientists consider the Central Asian red deer subspecies the ancestor of all red deer in the world. In Kazakhstan, morales live in various types of landscapes, highlands, taiga and wooden steppe. The history of the morale population on the territory of Akmola and Karaganda regions was quite dramatic. In the late 19th century and in the first half of the 20th century, excessive hunting and demand for medicinal velvet antlers put the Sariaka morales on the verge of extinction. For many years, there were no morales seen in Osakarov district. The restoration of morale population in Karaganda region began in the 80s of the last century in Kakaralensk. Initially, the deer were temporarily placed in open-air cages and then released into the natural habitat. In 2002, seven morales were transported from Kakaralinsk to Beladimov district. The experiment was a success and in seven months, the scientists brought another 26 red deer from eastern Kazakhstan region. Ecologists do not approve of introducing alien species to ecosystems, although there are exceptions. The restoration of the disappeared native species is always good for wild nature. Such a hallmark species as morales, such beautiful animals, of course, have brought their former charm to these mountains. The Forestry and Fauna Committee has been successfully implementing reintroduction actions in various regions of Kazakhstan. And not only for morales, but also for other animals. Asiatic wild asses, Bukhara deer, ruffed bustards are also undergoing the release into the wild. A large-scale international project on returning the Turanian tiger to the nature of Kazakhstan was launched as well.
Speaking of reintroduction and game breeding activities in the country, the experience of Karaganda region on breeding morals and releasing them into the wild is absolutely unique. Yet, special reintroduction programs are under development which focus on other species. By 2011, at the time of the park's establishment, over 150 morales were living on its premises in free natural conditions. Several years ago, the law on the use and reproduction of fauna was supplemented with amendments on game breeding by farms. This is an example illustrating the overall attitude of our top officials and the Ministry of Agriculture to the issue. They are working on it and strive to stimulate game breeding. In different countries they deal with game breeding quite differently due to national specifics, economic structure and political framework. In Europe, there are many private hunting farms. Game breeding is quite developed and enjoys a wide spectrum of preferences and benefits. In the US, wild animals belong to the state. There, the establishment of private fenced-off game breeding farms is not forbidden, but isn't encouraged either. Budget funds are allocated for preserving wild populations. This year, the Outdoor KZ team went to see the worker Fish and Wildlife Agency specialists on restoring the bighorn sheep population in the states of Nevada and California. They caught the mountain rams from helicopters, mocked them with radio collars and moved to their new habitats. In total, since 2002, 247 red deer were released into the wild. And many of them have already left the limits of the park. Our film crew had a chance to observe the last release with our own eyes and even with the help of the drone. While one group of inspectors was driving the deer on horseback, the others organized a barrier on the animal's way with the machinery and made an opening in the fence. Forty morales broke out that time. The released animals will have to go through the difficult phase of adapting to the wild. As in the nursery, there were no predators. There was some extra nutrition, but from now on, they will be on their own. Some of them will inevitably fall victims to wolves and lynxes. Some will die during severe winters, and some will leave the park's territory and will be exposed to the lethal threat of firearms. Yet this is the price of freedom. The long-term scientific research showed that farm-bred wild animals lose some of their instincts and behavior reactions. In captivity, the evolutionary process slows down or stops completely. The daily fight for survival, natural and sexual selection allow wild animals maintaining the genetic health of populations. The Belladim of Branch has the fenced area of 400 hectares. This is where we keep our morales for subsequent release. Every year we let several animals free into the wild. The territory of every national park is divided into reserved, recreation and commercial zones. National parks are different from reserves by their mission, that is, not only protecting the animals from humans, but also developing ecotourism. In his message, our president spoke about the importance of developing ecotourism in Kazakhstan. A lot of tourists from foreign and CIS countries, as well as local, come to our park. Whereas reserves are closed for mass tourism, the best national parks of the world, on the contrary, accept millions of visitors every year.
The task of their staff is to organize tourism activities in a way they don't significantly damage the wild nature. We have four main routes, three of them in Akmola region and one in Karaganda region. We asked Ruslan Mukashev, one of the game managers working in Belodima branch, to help us with the expedition plan. We would like to see and, if possible, film as many animals as possible. Of course, first of all, we are interested in our gali, morals, and, if we are lucky, elks. To see rows and boars would be great too. We are interested in everything. We want to show all the fauna of the national park to our audience. No problem. I'm sure that in our park you will be able to film everything, including morales and dagali. In fact, morales roam all over the place. We have many of them and they live across the park. Late at night, an old friend of ours comes to the checkpoint. Alken Aitimov, an old-time member of the Outdoor KZ team. He started his tourist career as a hunter but has replaced the gun with the camera a long time ago. Photographing wild animals turned into a real passion for him. Alken has only three days, but hopes to get at least a couple of good shots. Game manager Nurum Sagaliev greets Alken and will accompany his guest. Our film crew will follow their adventures, filming everything but not intervening. Our task is to show you how eco-tours take place in national parks. The guys from the Central Park's office sent me to this checkpoint. I'm an eco-tourist and love taking pictures of wild animals in their natural habitat. What animals we can see and photograph? Early in the morning, we will go to the Agali lambing locations and will try to get some pictures of morale, elk or boar on the way. Will you spend the night in a guest house? No, I have a tent and a sleeping bag with me. Full battle rattle. I love nature, so I want to spend as much time outside as possible. Do you know why I chose the operator career? Because the cameraman is always shooting but not working. In order to see hoofed animals during morning grazing, one needs to get up early. During the day, the animals hide in secluded places. There are two strategies for photographing wild animals, to wait for them in a special hide or to try approaching them as close as possible to get a good shot. The first option requires a lot of time and thus only professional photographers generally resort to it. Amateurs prefer walking around in search of a good image as it means good fitness, exciting entertainment and observing the wild nature at the same time. During summer, the Agali break into groups based on social and sexual characteristics. Adult males form small bachelor pools from 3 to 10 individuals. The oldest stags who have experienced it all during their long life and the end lose interest in communicating with their kind and fall into a gloomy misanthropy. They go to the most remote corners to live in solitude. Eventually, they fall victims to wolves or die from exhaustion. Young males are more sociable. They form large groups, sometimes up to 50 individuals. In their turn, females gather in special places which inspectors call kindergartens. Fighting for life in the wild can be compared to economy and each wild animal is a natural-born economist. 
The DNA spiral of each animal contains a built-in calculator allowing to unmistakably count power inputs and outputs and analyze the corresponding risks. For example, the diet of feeding females should include protein-rich bean plants and they need to regularly go to watering places. Therefore, the females are forced to remain in valleys even though this might be associated with additional risk. On the contrary, adult males can afford themselves a less calorie-intense diet if it minimizes the risks and helps to avoid the proximity of humans and farm animals. The Argali, unlike other hooped animals, are very much concerned about the disturbance factor. In the fall, during the mating season, under the influence of hormones, the males become less wary, descend to valleys and form joint herds with the females. Alcan is happy. Not every tourist manages to see the Agali just seven meters away. It would be great to also get a shot of an elk. There are about 40 elks living in the national park, but seeing them is not an easy task. Alcan has noticed three elks in his binoculars, tried to approach them, but unfortunately the sharp animals noticed him and ran away. Yet Alcan is not upset, as each and every minute spent outdoors is a blessing for him. We have an immense natural diversity. Our fauna is so rich and the territory of the country is so big that the whole life will not be enough to see it all. For this reason I became interested in expeditions. This is what I have been doing recently. Our expedition yesterday and today was very interesting. I'm also fond of sports and do triathlon and running. We covered a good distance chasing the Argali in the mountains today. It was a good training session. Do you remember when we were literally 15 meters away from them once? It was the first time of being so close to them in my whole life. Unfortunately, the three elks in the thickets ran away today. But this is yet another reason to come back here again. Rakhmet Narum, thank you. I've spent so many great days in your national park. I sincerely consider it the nicest that I have been to. We are saying goodbye to Al Khan and continuing our expedition. We have seen the animals inhabiting the mountain part of the park. It is time to get acquainted with its steppe inhabitants. The meadows are dazzling with bright herbs and grasses. Windflower, the first spring flower of the wooded steppe, has already finished blossoming and yielded fruit. Now it looks nothing like in the early spring when the meadows were painted with bright violet. The windflower is listed in the Red Book of Kazakhstan. Its popular names are Dream Grass and Enchanter's Nightshade. This bright colored flower is often mentioned in legends and classical literature. Birches have covered with green for a long time, yet the black alder is still dark with its naked trunk. Soon it will also put on its summer dress. In poetry, alder and birch are called girlfriends. Yet if comparing trees to people, then alder is more like birch's dependent. Saturating the soil with hummus, birch groves pave the way for alder woods. Steppe groundhog or bybuck is of course the most widespread small animal in the steppe. It differs from the mountain grey groundhog by its shorter as if trimmed fur. At present, the groundhog population is on the rise. When its fur was in high demand, the hunters killed them by hundreds. Approximately in the mid-90s of the last century, green activists managed to bring the demand for groundhog fur down. Its price sharply fell and now they represent virtually no commercial interest. 
you can encounter these charming Punchinellos along every step road. Bye bucks live in small family colonies, while the families feeding the colony is vigilantly protected by its sentry. At the first sight of danger, it makes a sharp whistle and everybody hides in the holes. In winter, groundhogs fall into hibernation and wake up only in mid-March. The mating season starts soon after the awakening, the baby groundhogs appear in early May. The mating season passed long ago, but the family group is still coddling with each other. Living collectively, it is so important to maintain friendly and tender relations. Badger is somewhat similar to Groundhog, but is a notorious individualist. It doesn't like communal living and prefers to be left alone. A couple of sociable plovers have recently come from India. In winter they live a typical downshift alive in Goa or Sri Lanka, but every spring return to their native Sariaka to build their nest and bring up baby birds. Plovers are listed in the Red Book of Kazakhstan, although nobody ever hunted these nice little birds. The reason for the decline of their population are humans plowing the virgin lands. Stone chats live all over the place, in the mountains and in the steppe. These beautiful singing birds of the flycatcher family usually appear in Sariaka in early April and fly away in mid-September. They are such fidgets, you only manage to focus your lens and they fly away to another place. There are a lot of ducks around steppe lakes. The Kazakhs call common shell ducks ataika. Common as well as rudy shell ducks nest in earth holes near reservoirs. It's so big and beautiful. Black grouse is very common for Karaganda region and yet it's really hard to get their picture. The mating begins in the dark. As the east brightens, the intensity of emotions amplifies and the black and white males as if knights clash in the tournament. Each fighter wants to confirm its social status and prove to its darling that it is the strongest and that only its genes will help the population survive. Great step stretches for thousands of kilometers. Its area is huge, but the historical monuments, burials, traces of ancient battles are concentrated in certain areas for which people fought with utmost fury. Undoubtedly, such mountain oases with dense vegetation and diverse fauna were exactly that promised land, possessing which meant fighting for it. Местные жители называют это захоронение Калмак Маласы. The locals call this burial Kalmak Molasi, which means Jungarian grave. In the 18th century, the fierce battles between the Kazakhs and the Oirats took place here. In the future, research will help to identify the exact date of this historical monument. By appearance, it's similar to all other early Turkic burials of the 7th, 9th centuries of our era. Upon returning to the city, we will show these pictures to experts. We are moving 30 kilometers to the north in space and 2,000 years in time. On the left bank of the Kumai River, near the settlement of Karagaili, they found a large number of historical and ethnographic monuments of different eras bronze, early iron and western Turkey Kaganate periods. All of them are densely located within the 5 to 7 kilometers radius. Yeah, 
Eras, cultures and beliefs were changing. But in the course of the last 2,500 years, for some reason people chose this valley to build various cult facilities. Was it accidental? What has been drawing people's attention so much? Such stone sculptures are called balbals. Archaeologists date them to the 1st, 4th centuries AD. They find them across the huge space from Mongolia to the Ukrainian steppes, which means that once upon a time, these lands shared one culture. We have Baluantas, an open-air museum and pine groves with rich fauna. Rows, hares, groundhogs, golden eagles, falcons, you name it. The Falcon Mountains are another popular tourist attraction. We start our acquaintance with the Falcon Mountains at the checkpoint, where tourists can also find shelter with electricity, utilities and even internet connection, although rather poor. From here, tourists go on radial tours around the Falcon Mountains. This is the settlement of Balikte. Kaigel D. Amantaevich has lived all his life in these parts and we couldn't have found a better guide around the Falcon Mountains. Every summer they organize a children's sports camp here. They acquire tourist skills, learn to love and respect their native land. Young sportsmen from various tourist clubs come here as instructors. We are installing this temporary bridge here for tomorrow's training. And where are you from? What kind of sport do you do? We are engaged in tourism. How long have you been doing this? We're just starting. Mountaineering? Yes, tourism and mountaineering. What's the name of your club? Tourism Multiathlon. Hiking, mountaineering, water tourism and skiing. Someone comes to the Falcon Mountains to train. Someone just wants to rest from the city bustle in the fresh air. And someone is looking for health. The spring originating on the mountain top has been considered health giving since ancient times. There is a legend that in the old days when people still believed that every mountain and every spring had its spirit patron, a magician lived on the top of the Falcon Mountains with his beautiful daughter. Once upon a time, after a bloody battle, a severely wounded warrior came to their dwelling. The art of the old sorcerer and the curative properties of the spring quickly put the jigged back on his feet. During the treatment, the warrior fell in love with a girl and she returned his affection. Yet the old sorcerer did not want to lose his only assistant and refused the Bartir's marriage proposal. Then the soldier kidnapped his beloved one in the dark of the night and tried running away on a black horse. The angered father appealed to his spirit patrons. The spirit of the thunderstorm threw a lightning towards the fugitives and turned them into stones. Modern medicine, of course, doubts the existence of forest spirits, but the medicinal effect of the pine-saturated air in the local groves is surely there. A couple of days spent in the Falcon Mountains will charge any body with loads of energy for months to come. The Outdoor KZ Permanent TV Expedition has marked one more place on the ecotourism map of Kazakhstan. We have been traveling for many years, but haven't yet told you about even one-tenth of the wonderful places across our country worth visiting.